Greetings, everyone, and thank you for being here on podcast 11 of Solar Coaster, a diary by me, by R. Kelly. We're going to keep reading. She's teaching angels how to love. When I arrived home from Europe, I was surprised to see my sister Teresa waiting at the airport. What's wrong? I asked. It's mom. She said, what about mom? She's gotten worse. We need to go see her. How much worse? Much worse. Why didn't anyone tell me? Mama said not to. She says your tour is going good and she didn't want anything to mess it up. Where is she at? Rosalind Hospital on 111th Street. I raced over. My brothers were sitting in the hallway. A doctor was standing in front of the door to her room. Robert Kelly, he said. I'm Robert Kelly. Let's talk before you go in there. Why? We need to talk. You need to prepare yourself. I was already scared, but the word prepare scared me more. Prepare for what, I asked. Let's just sit and talk. Doctor, please, just say what you have to say. Your mother has incurable cancer that has reached its final stage. You're lying, I shouted. I, I, was, I wish I were. I wish I could say there was hope. My mother says there's always hope. I'm sorry, Robert, but your mother is very near the end. When I opened the door, my heart fell to the floor. My mother looked like a completely different person from the one I had seen just a few short weeks ago. I never seen her look like this before. She was so much smaller. Her eyes were as yellow as yellow crayon. Her body was as shriveled up. I went to her side and started crying. Oh, baby, she said, you got to get out of here. I told them I didn't want you to see me like this. I had to see you, I said. I don't want you to have this memory, baby. I want you to remember when I was healthy and strong. No one told me, mom. No one said that you gotten sick. It happened really fast, son. How can you forgive me? I asked. Forgive you for what? For not being here, for not coming home. I didn't want you home, Rob. I wanted you out there singing. That's what you were born to do. I held her hand and said, Mom, I promise you, I'm going to be the best writer on the planet for you. I'm going to be the biggest singer. I love you, Mom. I love you, Rob. I know that, baby. I've already, I've already seen it coming true. Now, please get on out of here and let me be. I need to be alone. I didn't want you. I don't want you to be alone, Mom. I can't live without you. I'll always be with you, Rob. You know that. I love you, Mom. I love you, Rob. I left her room with tears in my eyes. I didn't know what to do or where to go. So I went to the studio. I had to be around music. I had to sing. To me, singing is like praying. It's the most powerful prayer I can send up. I was playing a song for you when a call came in. Joanne Kelly was gone. I stopped playing, put my head down, and just sat there. There were people around trying to comfort me, but I didn't hear their words. At that moment, I heard a new melody. I didn't have words for it, but the melody was strong. It had my mother's new spirit on it. It stayed in my head. I thought of recording the melody, but something stronger was pulling at me. I knew I had to do to, to go see my mother one more time. When I got to the hospital, I learned that they hadn't moved her from her room. I told the staff that I needed this one last time to be alone with my mother. I sat next to her bed and looked at her lifeless face. Cancer had been cruel to her, but when I looked at her, I remembered her when she was still healthy and full of life. I took her hand and said, I swear this to you, Mom. I swear this with God as my witness. I will be the greatest artist in the world. I will do this for you because of how you always believed in me. I got up and left. People stopped me saying words I couldn't even hear. It may sound strange, but my mind was fixated on basketball. The only thing I could think of that might get me through the coming hours. Just being out there on the floor, running and shooting and giving it my all, the spirit of grief was so huge that only basketball could keep me going. I imagine there were people who, upon hearing horrible news, beat their fists against the wall. That's their way of coping. My way was a full court. A full court press bouncing that ball on the hardwood floor. I exhausted myself by playing ball for three straight hours. Afterwards, I went to the studio where the same melody kept echoing through my mind. Every time I started to sing it, though, I broke down and cried. 
Mom was like God to me. She was the one who never judged me. She never abandoned me. She listened patiently to my doubts and fears. She encouraged my hopes and dreams. Without my mother, I felt there was no one to call on anymore. I cried like a baby, cried until I felt like I had used up every tear in my body. How could I go on? How could I live without Joanne Kelly by my side? I couldn't complete the 12 play project without paying tribute to my mother. I thought about the melody that had invaded my mind after she had died. It was still there, but there were still no words to go with it. I'm the kind of writer who never chases a song. I wait until the song chases me. And though I knew the unwritten song was going to be one of the most important of my life, I couldn't force it into existence. I had to be patient. But I also had to dedicate a song to Ke Joanne Kelly. I thought back on her life and remembered how when I was just a little boy in the 70s, mom loved the spinners. She used to stop whatever she was doing when their lead singer, Philip Wine, started in on one of a kind lover, love affair or mighty love or love don't love nobody. He also sang a song that talked about a mother named Sadie Mae, sweeter than cotton candy and stronger than Papa's old brandy. Every line of that song made me think of my mother. I've never been inclined to read a cover song. I've always been proud of my originals. But I knew that song, Sadie. I pay my mother the highest tribute. The song was out of her era. It was a song sung in a high style of soul that she had taught me to honor. And while it's true that 12 Play would turn out to be a record that broke records and busted all up some old taboos, an album that would be remembered for songs about sensuality and sex, the songs that meant the most to me is Sadie. My mother was my Sadie, my everything. I do apologize for getting emotional on that part right there because that part I've been through. And I understand it. And um, rest in peace to my mom as well, Mary Foster. The depths of my struggles determined the heights of my success. When my mother was still alive, I was, a, I was a boy. After she died, I became a man. When my mother was still alive, my career was starting to build. After she died, my career blew up. The most tragic event of my 26-year-old life, the death of my precious mother, coincided with the explosion of my music around the world. Because she was gone, I was sadder than I'd ever been in my life. And not too long after my mother passed, my grandmother lost her battle with cancer and went to join her daughter, Joanne. Because Bump and Grind became the long, longest lasting R&B hit in the history of Billboard's charts, not to mention a number one hit as well, I was more successful than ever. Grief and joy had a hard time shaking hands. My mind was like a mixing board where the tracks, the up-tempo, happy jams, and the deep, dark blues grooves were leaking all over each other. I reached my goal. i become a superstar. And while I could feel my mom's spirit still feeding me love, it hurt my heart that my eyes couldn't see her face. She was no longer there to give me a hug. A man, and man, did I need a hug. Looking back, I remember feeling that I couldn't go on without my mother, and if my career hadn't taken the amazing turns that it did, maybe I would have broken down completely and spent the next two years or two doing nothing but grieving. But music wouldn't let me do that. My music took over and suddenly started sweeping the country. Suddenly I was famous, but fame almost overwhelmed me. It was like a hungry monster with an appetite that could never be satisfied. It wanted more and more. And then just when I thought it was satisfied, I asked for even more. Things were happening so fast that I could hardly keep up with myself. These were good things, musical gifts that were tremendous changes and undeniable blessings. Take, for instance, the fine art of the remix. Back in the late 80s and early 90s, most hits records, uh, most hit records got a second life and sometimes even a first life My releasing a remixed version of the original. Usually remixes were done by hot engineers or producers to create new versions of a song, which was often for clubs. On the 12 play album, I decided to do the remixes of my own records instead of having someone else do them. Because of the advances in recording technology and my growing confidence and experience in the studio, I could see how to break down the different elements of the song and put them back together in a different configuration. 
I can modify the groove, strip the vocal and add new elements, throw in new sounds and accents. In short, I can re-engineer the music in a way that gave it a whole new flavor. I did two remixes of Bump and Grind, the old school mix and how I feel it extended mix. <clears throat> when the version of the song we shot the video too, I also did my first remix for Your Body's Calling and as the B-side of Your Body's Calling single. All the remixes were huge successes. I don't know how many remixes I've done for Your Body's Calling and I recently remixed Bump and Grind as a choir version for my Love Letter tour. I saw the remix as a new art form to explore. I loved it as a canvas for sound. It wasn't that I no longer liked starting with a clean slate and creating a brand new song. I'd always liked doing that, but it was no longer either or. Now I could do both. Not only could I create a new feeling out of a previous recorded song of mine, I could do it for other artists as well. Just like that, I established another major career as the remix man. Making matters sweeter, the remix of Your Body's Calling sold more copies than the original. By 1994, 12 Play had sold more than 5 million copies and the sexy R. Kelly brand was established. Jive's president, Barry Weiss, publicly labeled me a pure artist and an old-fashioned creative genius. Jive had no problem happily allowing me to control my own creative destiny. This kind of artistic power was a big boost to my ego. I was happy that my fans and the people I worked with accepted me as who I am. I didn't have to be phony or change my music or bow to the will and demands of other others about my music. I was riding high as a real artist and a rising star. But according to my plans and definition of success, I still hadn't risen high enough. While 12 Play was rising on a chart, Janet Jackson's Janet album was the biggest of her career. Janet, Jimmy Jam, and Terry Lewis is a wonderful beautiful song that they called Anytime, any place. It was especially appealing since early in her career, Jenny had a hit, Let's Wait, Let's Wait a While. Now the waiting was over and it was cool. Anytime, any place. When they sent me the song to be remixed, I was ready. And when my remix went crazy on the charts, I saw that by reimagining songs that people already loved, I could enjoy another outlet for my musical energy. One thing was building atop of another. And just when I thought it couldn't get any be bigger or better, it did. Enter Michael Jackson. Wow. You are not alone. As a kid, I watched a lot of TV and loved much of what I saw. TV was my window into worlds outside of our little home. Cartoons were wonderful. They were crazy funny. Sometimes I picture myself jumping into a cartoon and running after the characters, but I never thought the characters were real. T take Mickey Mouse. Mickey was the superstar of cartoon characters. Donald Duck was cool and so was Goofy. I dug the rug runner, the road runner, and Porky Pig, whose, whose stutter reminded me of my Uncle Doug. Mickey, though, was the boss. Mickey ruled the TV screen, but I knew he was just make-believe. Well, in a funny kind of way, I thought of Michael Jackson the same way. When the Jackson 5 popped up into our lives, we loved them to death. We loved Michael and Jermaine, Jackie, Tito, and Marlon. We knew one from the other. We couldn't wait for them to come on TV and sing their songs about school like ABC. They were as cool as cartoon characters beyond human, and they were black like us. We've been told the fairy tale myth of how Diana Ross had discovered them later I learned that wasn't true, but as a kid, I believed the myth. When the Jackson 5 were set to appear on American Bandstand or the Ed Sullivan Show, we we got the TV a half hour earlier so we wouldn't miss a single minute. I was still a little kid, four or five, when the Jackson 5 actually became a cartoon show where the brothers were animated like Mickey Mouse. That closed the deal. They weren't real. Mickey Michael was Mickey Mouse. When Miss McClin and when Miss McClin came along and said that one day I'd be writing for Michael Jackson, I didn't believe her. And then when Mom died and I leaned on Miss McClin even more, she kept saying the same thing: "You're more than just an artist, Rob. You're a writer whose songs will be sung by the brightest, biggest artists in the world." 
I've been going through so many personal struggles and it seemed like everywhere I turned, I was losing people. Just before we were about to leave on the Big Ten, 10 week, 12 play tour, the bus was were gassed up. The equipment was loaded and I was sitting there waiting for my boys, the guys from Public Announcement who still sang back up and danced at my shows on the videos to show up, but they never did. Because of all my set routines with the guys, I had to change the show. I made the necessary adjustments and to my surprise, none of the fans seemed to miss public announcement. They yelled and screamed louder than ever. The tour was a huge hit. Michael was on my mind when towards the end of the 12 play tour, we were in Gary, Indiana, the Jackson's hometown. I was also thinking about my mother and our travels to Gary to see her grandfather and how we sit on the porch. We would play his guitar for us. He would play his guitar for us and my mother would sing. When the thoughts of Michael and my mother came together, out came a melody, the same melody that continued to haunt me after my mother's death. After mom died, I lost a person very dear to me whom I loved with all my heart and soul. I wanted to let this person know that I would always be with her, even though we couldn't be together. So this time when I heard the melody, the notes were carrying words. The words were clear. They said, you are not alone. I got this feeling in my gut, goosebumps sent chills up and down my arms. I ran to the first piano I could find and started playing that melody and singing those words, you are not alone. It was my mother talking to me. It was me reaching out to an incomparable loved one and letting her know that although we were apart, I would always be there for her. The further I developed the song, the more it sounded like Michael. I heard his inflections, felt his spirit. I knew this was the right song for Michael Jackson. Once I got to Chicago, I went to the studio and put down a demo. By then, the whole story was there. Another day is gone. I'm still all alone. How could this be? You're not here with me. You never said goodbye. Someone tell me why. Did you have to go and leave me my world so cold? Every day I sit and ask myself, how did love slip away? Someone whispers in my ear and says, you are not alone. I am here with you. Though you're far away, I am here to stay. Just the other night, I thought I heard you cry, asking me to come and hold you in my arms. I can hear your prayers, your burdens I will bear. But first I need your hand, then forever can begin. When I sang on the demo, I purposely captured Michael's style, even catching the tones of his voice. That was easy since I had been listening to Michael my entire life. I loved how Quincy Jones had produced Michael's Off the Wall. I loved Thriller and Bad. I knew Teddy Riley had co-produced Dangerous, and I really wanted to be in that company, in the company of those who had worked with Michael. I had my manager send him the song, A Day Pass. Michael Jackson was real. He looked at least eight feet tall. He looked like an avatar. My manager called. He wants to do, he wants to do it. He said, Michael wants to do it. I repeat it. You sure? His people called. They love the song. That's fantastic. That's amazing. I was shouting out the good news, but there's one thing, Rob, what's that? He wants half the publishing. The publishing represents ownership of the song. Much as I love Michael and much as I understood that business is business, I believe that given the success of 12 play, I had earned the right to keep all my publishing and retain all the ownership. Tell his people I said that's that that no disrespect, but I don't want to do that. It would be the dream of my life to have Michael sing that song, but it's a song that I need to own. You sure, Rob? You you sure you want to take that chance? I'm sure, I said. If Michael really loves the song as much as I think he does, he'll sing it anyway. He'll realize he was born to sing it. My manager conveyed my position to Michael's manager. One day passed and another, still another. I was nervous. I was thinking about nothing except whether Michael Jackson was going to sing my song. Then the phone finally rang. My manager was on the line. Well, well, what? He said, seizing me. Is he going to sing it? Hell yeah, he's going to sing it. Thank you, Jesus, I yelled. Not only is he going to sing it, he's coming to Chicago so you can show him how to sing it. When? Next week? You're kidding. I never I never kid about something. It's important, Rob. Not when it comes to you producing Michael Jackson. My producing Michael Jackson, he was going to sing You Are Not Alone. I kept running those words through my mind. I still couldn't believe it. 
What better way to send a radio message than through the King of Pop himself? I immediately got nervous and started to freak a little. It was all coming true. Michael Jackson was re really getting on a plane and flying to Chicago for the express purpose of being produced by me in the studio of my choice. My choice was CRC Studios just off Michigan Avenue in downtown Chicago. I knew it like the back of my hand. My engineers were the best. The atmosphere was cool. I knew Michael would be comfortable and we could ensure his private space. Whether Michael Jackson, wherever Michael Jackson went, though, the world knew about it. It was like there were secret agents putting out the word. So days before he landed in Chicago, the city knew he was coming. They were they were there were mentions in the newspaper and on TV. The whole town was weird for his arrival. I was wired. I couldn't wait. The day finally came. I got to the studio two hours early. I ordered my favorite Chinese food. I was sure to include some vegetarian dishes for Michael. I was so nervous that I started practicing in front of the food, just how I would introduce Michael. Would I say, Mike, would you like some Chinese food? Or Mike, want some of this, man? Or maybe it, it'd be better to say, if you're in the mood for Chinese food, Michael, you're welcome to it. I was in the middle of all this when the studio phone rang. The engineer answered all I heard him say was, OK, what's up? I asked. They said the talent has landed and is 30 minutes away. Michael's people has specified that they wanted only me and my engineers present during the session. My manager, though, has showed up like everyone else. He wanted to meet Michael. The phone rang again. Talent was 20 minutes away. I went back to rehearsing how to offer Michael Chinese food. Then another call 10 minutes away. I went to the bathroom to wash my hands super clean. I knew Michael didn't like dirt. He was a clean freak. He didn't eat meat. That's why I had those vegetarian meals. The talent has arrived, my engineer announced. Three minutes later, my security guys appeared. They made sure they knew who he was. They made sure that the route from the car to the studio was clear. Next, we heard that the talent was in the building. And the next thing I knew, Michael Jackson was walking through the door. Michael Jackson was real. He looked at least eight feet tall. He looked like an avatar. He was wearing a black mask over his face. Only his eyes were showing. My manager was the first to make a move. He went over to hug him. Michael stopped the hug and offered his hand instead. Then my manager introduced him to my engineers. Michael shook their hands. Finally, Mike walked over to me. He looked me in the eyes, opened his arms, and gave me the hug of my life, whispering to me in his lighter than air soft high voice, the world's going to be singing this song. I blurted out something like, silly like, congratulations on everything you've done, Mike. Congratulations on being Michael Jackson. Just about then, Bubbles the Chimp pranced into the room. In my mind, I called him Bubbles Trouble. The Chimp made me nervous. He's friendly, isn't he, Mike? Oh, yeah, he's not going to hurt you. Anyway, I said, I'm just glad you like the song. I don't like it, Rob. I love it. I don't want to change one thing. I want to sing it just the way you wrote it. You captured me beautifully. That's the reason I came here. We can get started as soon as I do my vocal warm-ups. If you excuse me for a minute, I said I'll be right back. I walked to the bathroom and just fell out on the floor. I broke down and cried. It wasn't that Michael Jackson was singing my song. It was that Michael had felt how I caught his spirit. Michael Jackson had come to Chicago to work with me. When I got back to the studio, I heard screeching. I thought it was Bubbles throwing a fit, but it was Michael doing his vocal warm-ups. He was screeching like a wounded animal. Man, I thought this is a strange way to warm up, but he's Michael Jackson, the biggest star in the world. And if that's how he warms up, it's cool with me. Before we start working, Rob said, Mike, would you mind talking to my vocal coach in L.A.? He said something. He has something he wants to ask you. No problem, Mike. When we reached him, the coach said, Mr. Kelly, Michael just wanted to ask me if it would be OK if you only did the first verse today. You can start on the chorus tomorrow. That will help Michael converse his voice. Sure thing. I said, amazed at Michael's humility. He had asked his coach to ask me if it was OK to work on Mike's timetable. Thanks for understanding, Rob, said Michael. I hope this won't mess up your flow. I flow with you, Mike. Anything you want, man. For the next few hours, we worked the verse with Michael trying as hard as he could to be true to my demo. It's better than the demo. I kept, I kept telling him way better. Next day, of course, I was less nervous. I knew the chorus was a killer and Michael would nail it on 
in no time. When he started singing, though, he immediately felt the need for background vocals. Rob, he said in that high sounding voice, would you mind coming here and singing backgrounds with me? Mind? Are you kidding? Michael Jackson was asking me to sing with him. I had to practically stop myself from running to the vocal booth. I paced myself so I could walk slowly, but in my heart, I felt like a little girl. <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> When we started to sing, the blend was perfect. We were butter and toast. He did that same rocking motion I'd seen him do on We Are The World. Sitting there next to me, my voice over his, his voice over mine. I tasted heaven, heaven on earth. Brother, this is as good as it gets. You know, Rob, he said later that afternoon, sometimes it can take me a month to get a song where I want it. Me too, Mike agreed. Sometimes... It takes me more than a month. I'm glad you understand. You'll be patient with me, won't you? I'll be whatever you want me to be, Mike. It's still like a dream for me. Can I ask you something? Sure. Is there a mall around here, Rob? Just a couple of blocks away. Would you go there with me? I love malls. I love them too, Mike. Let's roll. With Bubbles and the security team in place, we went to Water Tower Place, one of my nicest malls in Chicago. Mike headed straight for the Disney store where he was fascinated by a larger than life statue of Donald Duck hung above the entrance. That's beautiful, said Michael. Do you think they'll sell it to me? I'd love to have Donald Duck for Neverland. Couldn't hurt to ask, I asked. Of course, Michael Jackson walking into the Disney store caused a near riot. When the manager appeared, Michael couldn't be any sweeter. Is there any way I could buy that Donald Duck? He asked. I'm afraid not, Mr. Jackson. It's permanently built in the front of the store. Oh, that's a shame, Michael said politely. But thank you anyway, sir. I never met anyone with better manners. We spent the next three weeks perfecting the song. As far as the production went, Mike let me take the lead. Of course, he had ideas for instrumental touches of his own, and they were all great. We never had a single argument. After the sessions, he'd hang around the studio to talk. He was interested in my remix methods. He loved the remix on Your Body's Calling and wanted to know how I'd done it. When I explained that I worked by instinct, he could completely understood. The experience of working with Mike was drama free. Every night after he left the studio and got in his van, people were hanging out the windows of office buildings and hotels, stretching their necks to get a glimpse of him. He'd also stop and wave. When the job was done, it was time for him to leave Chicago. He gave me another hug and said, you're my brother. I was too choked up to say anything. When You Are Not Alone dropped as a single, second single of Mike's history album, it made the Guinness World Records book as the first song to debut at number one on the Billboard shop top 100 chart. It was number one in the U United Kingdom, as well as in France, New Zealand, Spain, Switzerland, and Japan. Mike was right. They were singing, all, singing it all over the world. When the video came out featuring Michael and Lisa Marie Presley, his wife at the time, I loved it for being so original. It got everyone talking. Unfortunately, the credits on the record listed Michael as a co-writer of the song. Naturally, that got me a little upset, but the minute I put a call in to Michael, he got right back to me. I'm so sorry, he said. My people are so used to me co-writing everything. They presume I'd done this as well. But mark my words, Rob, this mistake will be taken care of immediately. And it was. It would be some years before Michael cut another song of mine, One More Chance, for his number one compilation album. Before that, he invited me to his L.A. studio just as a guest. I wound up singing on that session and having a ball. We talk every three months or so. He'd tell me what was happening in his life, and I'd tell him what was going on in mine. Michael Jackson died on June 25, 2009. News of his death was like a hatchet to my chest. He went to me, he meant to me what breathing means to most people. He was not only my brother and friend, he was also my mentor. I am honored and blessed to have been in Michael's presence. I got to know him like most of the world never will on a person to person, soul to soul level. I broke down and cried when I saw a YouTube video of Michael dancing to Ignition Remix in the backseat of his friend's car. I mean, he was jamming. <laughs> you can tell he was fully into it and feeling it.
I was like, wow, he's doing my music. He's singing to my music. I've been in the business for over 20 years. I've written songs that have told that have sold around the world and won all kind of awards. But it wasn't until I saw the great Michael Jackson busting his familiar moves to my song that it all became official. Kelly is here, baby, for real. In late 2009, I used part of the video in tribute to Michael Jackson as part of my tour. The YouTube video sold in a montage of his performances and personal videos. After it played, I walked out on the stage and sang words that came after his death. Don't say goodbye to me. There is no need to. Don't say goodbye to me because I'm still with you. Don't say goodbye to me. Don't shed a tear because I'm still here. Go light a candle and say a prayer. Scream our victory because love is still there. The tribute was my way of keeping Michael with me, with all of us really. I refused to let him go and was determined not to let him die. Because he was superhuman, I was sure that Michael would live forever. So we're going to end there. And tomorrow we're going to be talking on the area of trade in my life. And uh, thank you so much for listening. So what are your views? I mean, how excited were you for Michael and R. Kelly to connect and how that made a big catapult into his life, which he was already R. Kelly. So, you know, m putting Michael Jackson in with the with his story, along with Gladys Knight and along with Janet Jackson, it all made put the icing on the cake. So what are your views on this part of the podcast? Thank you for joining podcast number, I believe it's number 11. Yeah. And uh, we will finish up tomorrow for the week. Um, we're three fourths into the book, so it's almost over. And uh, yeah, so we'll see you tomorrow.